uh, to give um, all of our participants a chance to interact with all the wonderful people who are working so hard to bring new therapies to, to, to treatment. Great, thank you. So just to set this up a little bit, we've never done anything like this, but if you can all envision if we were together in person in a big room, each of our um, companies here would have a table and you'd all be able to go to a table and have a chat with them and they'd share with you about where they are and their company and what's happening. So in lieu of that, this is our way of bringing a little snippet of each of the companies um, to you today in this very short session. Um, we won't have time for Q&A, but these are the companies that are joining us. We have a mixture of companies that are current, have current clinical trials underway, and then also companies that have had products that you are all familiar with and may have used over the years. So it's an opportunity for um, us to bring them to you. I have the privilege over the course of my work to interact with everybody that you'll be meeting today, but we wanted to give you the opportunity to meet them as well and to hear a little bit more about um, their company, what they're doing, and their interest here in cutaneous lymphoma. So we're going to start off with the companies that have current clinical trials. And obviously, this isn't everybody under the sun. I think we'd be here for a couple of hours if that was the case. But, you know, this is a snippet. But uh, I hope that you'll be able to learn a little bit more about each of the companies and their therapies that you didn't know. So we're going to start with the, those companies in clinical trials, and we'll finish up with a couple of the companies that have products uh, already commercially available that you may be using. And we're going to go in alphabetical order. So I'm going to turn it over um, to our friends with CRISPR Therapeutics. See, beginning of the alphabet, you all will get to test my ability to know my alphabet off the top of my head. And, um, and today we have joining us uh, Dana Lassour, who is uh, with Medical Affairs of CRISPR Therapeutics. And um, Richard, if you could put the CRISPR slide up, that would be great. And their therapy is CTX-130. And we've heard a lot about uh, CAR-T therapies and so forth. And this is a very exciting uh, early stage clinical trial. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dana to share a little bit about CRISPR and about CTX-130 and what's happening. So Dana, over to you. Awesome, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Awesome. Um, so again, hi, um, my name is Dana Lasser and I'm uh, with Medical Affairs with CRISPR Therapeutics. Um, and so thank you so much for having us here today. Um, I wanted to just give you a couple of company highlights about CRISPR Therapeutics, kind of what, we, what we're doing, what we're working on. And then I'll tell you some more about CTX-130, which is our allogeneic CAR T cell therapy that's in clinical trials right now. Um, and just before I begin, I, I do want to just um, clarify, uh, these are all investigational products, nothing of which has been um, approved by any health authority quite yet. So no, se no safety or efficacy has been established. And if you have additional questions, um, we would encourage you to reach out to your healthcare provider. Um, so just a couple highlights about CRISPR Therapeutics as a company. Um, we are a leading gene editing company and our focus is on developing uh, transformative gene-based medicines for serious diseases. And we utilize our um, proprietary CRISPR-Cas9 platform. And so CRISPR-Cas9 is a, is a gene editing technology and it allows for precise and direct changes to the genomic DNA. Um, and pretty much everything that we're working on right now, um, as I mentioned, is investigational and not approved by FDA, but we do have several programs across um, hematology, oncology, diabetes, as well as rare diseases. Um, and then today I'm going to be talking to you guys about um, one of our immuno oncology programs, CTX-130. Um, and so before discussing 130 directly, I did just want to um, try and explain uh, a little bit about what CAR T cell therapy is um, and kind of uh, how they are designed to potentially kill cancer cells and be used as a therapeutic. Um, so naturally in our bodies, we do have T cells um, and they're a type of immune system cell that is 
what it would normally do would be to find and attack other cells that may be infected by a virus or should not be in the body. And so when we are developing these CAR T cell therapies, what we're doing is we're modifying the DNA of the T cells. Um, and we're doing that with CRISPR-Cas9 um, in order and to hopefully uh, reprogram the cell to attack and kill the cancer cells. And so there are receptors on the CAR T cell um, that we program to target the receptors of the cancer cells. So that's kind of just as a high level what we're trying to do with, um, with these therapies. So um, as mentioned, um, we have RCTX-130, which is our investigational allogeneic CRISPR-Cas9 gene-edited um, anti-CD70 CAR T cell therapy that is currently in clinical trials uh, for patients with relapsed or refractory T, T or B cell malignancies. Um, and the reason why we've chosen um, and to, to target the therapy to CD70 is because CD70 is known to be expressed pretty highly in, in several types of lymphomas and, and other um, cancer types as well. Um, and because we are utilizing healthy donor T cells and not the patient's own T cells to manufacture these allogeneic CAR T cells, we believe that these allogeneic CAR T cells can be prepared in advance um, and then hopefully lead to streamlined manufacturing um, and increased access of the CAR T uh, therapies to patients. Um, and then now into just a little bit about um, our clinical trial. So it's called COBALT-LYM. Um, so it's COBALT-LYM. So it is um, you know, available on ct.gov to find more information, NCT0450. Two four four six, um, and it's our phase one open label multi center uh, single arm study. Again, evaluating our CTX one thirty um, investigational um, CD seventy CAR T um, in relapsed refractory B or T cell malignancies, and so. Um, I think the overall study design here is that after um, informed consenting and screening, the patients will undergo um, a couple of courses of lymphodepletion, and then we'll get their CTX-130 infusion. And then there will be follow-up study visits for patient monitoring after that. Um, and so some of the key inclusion criteria I wanted to, to just highlight to you all today is that um, this will be in a, a study of, of patients 18 years or older with confirmed diagnosis of a T-cell malignancy or um, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma that does have CD70 expression confirmed. Um, and for patients with peripheral T-cell lymphoma, so PTCL, um, these patients that will be invited on the study uh, must have received one or more prior lines of systemic therapy. Um, and then for our patients with cutaneous T-cell um, lymphoma, CTCL, we um, are requiring patients to have received at least two or more prior lines of systemic therapy. Um, we are at this time currently not including any patients who have had prior allogeneic stem cell transplantation or any prior treatment with anti-CD70 targeted agents. Um, and there may be some history of certain um, CNS or I'm sorry, um, central nervous system, cardiac or pulmonary um, conditions as well too um, that unfortunately may exclude some patients. But so you know, in this first part of the study, we're doing some dose escalation and looking um, to understand the incidence of adverse events. And then um, during our part B of this study, where we will expand, we're going to be looking more into objective response rate. Um, and throughout both parts of the study, we will be assessing uh, from a secondary endpoint perspective, um, progression-free survival, as well as overall survival. Um, and so just a couple of key takeaways um, before I pass it on to the next company here. Um, so immunotherapy has changed the treatment landscape for many hematologic malignancies, but I think to date really has had limited efficacy in the treatment of T-cell lymphomas. And so options are very limited for patients, especially with patients with the relapsed from refractory disease as well. Um, and so we think that allogeneic CAR T cell therapy may have potential as a therapeutic option in T cell lymphomas, um, particularly because we are using healthy donor cells um, to manufacture the therapy. And so um, on June 11th, 2022, we did present some preliminary safety and efficacy data from this study, Cobalt Lim, um, at the European Hematology Association, um, EHA Congress in Vienna. Um, 
And we will definitely have further data as the uh, study progresses to, to share with you all and as we move forward. So we're, we're very excited and excited for patients as well. So thank you so much, uh, Susan, I'll pass it back to you. Great, thank you, Dana. And we're very excited to keep track of what you're doing and how the trial is progressing. And I will just share with folks that if you haven't, um, we've got information about this on our website and there's some, some information coming down the pike. So stay tuned and we'll do our best to keep track of this for you. So thank you so much for that very quick, quick update um, on, on CTX 130 and CRISPR therapeutics. So next on deck, I'm going to invite Scott Phillips from Iraq to join us. Um, this is a very exciting clinical trial where they are looking at working on itch. And as I think all of us know, itch in cutaneous lymphoma is one of the biggest challenges in addition to the disease itself. And um, Scott, I'd love to have you come on with us and share a little bit about Elorac and what you're trying to accomplish with uh, naloxalone hydrochloride lotion and targeting the itch for cutaneous lymphomas with your clinical trial. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Susan. And thank you uh, to the uh, foundation for having me here and for having this for the patients. Um, I'm Scott Phillips. I'm a dermatologist and I'm senior vice president of scientific affairs at Elorac and we, are, we develop dermatology medicines as well as topically applied medications. And one of them uh, that Susan um, um, introduced that we're working on is naloxone lotion. And this is for the itching that's associated with mycosis chondroides and Cesare syndrome. And unlike what Dana described, this is not uh, attacking the disease, but attacking one of the symptoms. And as Susan also said, uh, can be very disruptive new quality of life, as well as um, in some cases add to the health consequences of uh, the disease. Um, so the itch in uh, cutaneous lymphomas is, is probably caused by a combination of immunologic and non-immunologic uh, factors. Um, it's often not responsive to the usual oral and topical medications that are available uh, for treating itching. Uh, and one of the causes that might contribute to the itch are actually naturally occurring opioids that are in the skin and in the body. And these are able to induce itching, especially in a skin environment that's altered by uh, the uh, cutaneous lymphoma. <clears throat> so naloxone is an opioid antagonist. And what that means is that it can block opioids. And uh, in an initial study of naloxone lotion, um, it was observed to decrease the amount of itch in patients who um, had uh, itching and cutaneous lymphoma. Um, now naloxone, you might've heard about, um, it's used uh, systemically by injection to uh, treat overdoses of systemic opioids. And it does this by reversing or antagonizing their effects uh, that are causing uh, sometimes very serious and life-threatening conditions like respiratory depression and other um, harmful symptoms. So it's not a new drug and it's been used safely, uh, systemically for uh, decades. Now our study uh, is testing this drug in a lotion formulation and it's testing it in a double-blinded fashion. And I'm sure for most of the, the patients, they know what this means, that neither the patient or the uh, doctor knows uh, at any time until after the study what they're using. Um, <clears throat> But this study is also interesting in that it, within it, it's um, both, every patient will receive both the active lotion and the uh, placebo lotion uh, in what's called a crossover design. So there's two treatment periods where uh, in the first one, a patient will receive either the active naloxone lotion or the placebo lotion, and they use it three times a day for two weeks. And during this time, they're recording its effect on itching, obviously, and also sleep, um, which can be affected by the itching. So we're, we're uh, uh, seeing how it uh, improves sleep as well. And then after the two weeks, they stop using either, uh, they stop using the study lotion and we wait um, a period of time so that the itching can return to a, a baseline level. And then in the next treatment period, which is identical, uh, the uh, opposite 
uh, lotion is used. <clears throat> um, and the, 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 a crossover study um, is important because it can add, it uh, increases the power of the study. Um, so it increases the chance uh, uh, because they're comparing uh, patients within themselves to determine if the active medication is actually uh, working. Um, so uh, after the two treatment periods, all the, all the patients that have participated are offered um, a six month uh, period of time where they're given the active lotion. So if they feel they've in, in, at some point benefited from using um, the lotion uh, during the uh, blinded periods, now they have an opportunity for six months to treat their itch with um, the active lotion. Um, um, I'll add that the, uh, as, as we know, uh, mycosis fungoides and cesare is a rare condition. And in the, and in the United States, um, we've uh, it's considered an orphan disease and we received um, an NIH orphan drug grant from the FDA that's been helping to fund uh, the study. Uh, currently, we're about halfway through the study um, and it's being conducted across the uh, United States at about 20 uh, different sites. Um, and um, as uh, Dana mentioned, one of the best sources for information on uh, clinical trials is clinicaltrials.gov. So um, I would encourage uh, um, you, the patients, to um, use this site. Um, it's, it's fairly easy to use on a basic level. For instance, if you put in uh, naloxone and lymphoma, um, our study would immediately come up uh, if you wanted more information. Um, but certainly, as Susan said, it's uh, it's almost it's very exhaustive in terms of current and 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 previous uh, trials that have been done in the disease. Um, and certainly, it also is a a good uh, uh, beginning to see what's out there and then bring that to your uh, uh, doctors to uh, discuss uh, further. So. Um, I think I'll end there. And uh, again, thank you to the foundation for inviting me here today. Great, thank you, Scott, that's wonderful. And I will also say that um, information on this clinical trial is on our website as well. So if you wanna start with us and we've got some additional information about um, the study and so forth. And we did an interview a couple of years ago, I think when the study came out with, with Scott that talks in a little bit more detail. So you know, I encourage you to go and, and uh, search that out on the website if you want to learn a little bit more. And um, if you're interested in the study, obviously ask your physicians if it would be appropriate for you. So thank you so much, Scott. So next up in our alphabetic order, we have our friends from Innate Pharma and we have Stephen Ties, who's head of clinical operations joining us from France with their therapy Lacutamab and the clinical trial Telemax. So Stephen, I'm gonna turn it over to you to share a little bit about uh, Lacutamab and the Telemac trial and um, what is happening in, with Innate Pharma. Great, Th thank you very much, Susan. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much uh, to the foundation for having Innate Pharma. Um, I think it's always a great opportunity to have this uh, direct interaction with the patient community. And I hope that I can share a few informations that, that are of interest. So um, as you mentioned, a, a quick word about myself. I'm, I'm a pharmacist by training, spent the uh, last 20 years working in clinical research. Uh, and for the last two years working at Innate Pharma. As you mentioned, uh, Innate Pharma is a French biotech. We are based in the south of France, in Marseille, sunny city, where we have our labs, where we have our offices, but we also have a small affiliate uh, in the United States. So Innate Pharma um, it's a, has a remarkable story. I think it's a biotech that uh, has been around for a bit over 20 years now and really been pioneering, I would say, in understanding the biology of the innate immune system. Um, and also trying to see what role the innate system, the innate immune system, sorry, can play in fighting cancer. And uh, most of you probably know that the immune therapies that we have today are more 
uh, I would say leveraging the adaptive immune system. The second wave, I think that is preparing and there are quite a number of, um, I think, molecules and, and developments ongoing is also to see what the innate type of immune cells can do in, uh, in treating cancers. So over these years at Innate Pharma, we have developed a, a couple of molecules uh, and a variety of them are now uh, being developed. But the reason why we're here today, because, it's be, because we also have a molecule called Lacutamap, uh, and Lacutamap uh, we are developing for the treatment of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Uh, and it's currently uh, evaluated in a phase two trial, which is called the Telomac trial. Uh, and in that trial, we are still actively recruiting uh, Caesary syndrome patients, uh, but also mycosis fungoides patients. And those patients are patients that have already uh, undergo, underwent uh, two systemic uh, therapies before being enrolled uh, in, in the trial. So but maybe a, a few words on Lacutamap itself, the molecule. Um, it's a humanized antibody, which is specifically uh, targeting uh, a biomarker. Uh, this biomarker is called KIR3DL2. Uh, but I think most important to know is that this biomarker normally is very limitedly expressed in normal tissue, but we see that it's very highly expressed uh, in patients that have cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, very high even in uh, Caesary syndrome, but also up to 50% in patients with mycosis fungoides or patients with peripheral T-cell lymphoma. And so the, the whole idea about developing this antibody is by specifically targeting and blocking uh, the CARE3DL2, it can activate and can engage those innate immune cells that can then help overcoming the cancer. And hopefully that's our intention, improving outcomes and quality of life uh, for patients. So today, wh where are we with the development? Um, and I, I think um, it's funny to hear the, the colleagues of, of, of CRISPR. Uh, they're still, I think, in an early phase. I think we've, in the meantime, we've, we are now in phase two. Of course, we also had our first phase one trial, which happened in 2019, uh, and I think uh, showed a very safety, um, a favorable safety profile of the drug. It also showed encouraging efficacy results, especially in Caesary syndrome patient with uh, an uh, overall response rate in, in the range of 40% and, and more. And in fact, this was the basis also for both uh, European and American uh, regulators to grant us specific designations in, in Europe, they're called prime uh, in the United States, it's called fast track. Um, to make a long story short, in fact, what, what, they, what it means is that regulators acknowledge that your molecule has a certain potential to improve outcomes in a setting where there is still, I think, a high unmet medical need and a, a real need to have alternative and new treatment options. Um, so today, like I said, we are, uh, that phase one is concluded. We are now in phase two uh, in the Telomac trial where we have two cohorts, well, actually three. So we have a cohort for Caesary syndrome patients. Like I said, the most important eligibility criteria is to have already had two systemic therapies. And then there are two cohorts for uh, MF patients. One that is specifically welcoming those patients that express highly this biomarker. And then we recently opened a, a third cohort, which is also welcoming both MF patients that express the biomarker and those that are not expressing the biomarker. So we are well over halfway uh, of, of recruitment. And the intention is to, to come back with uh, final results, um, I hope, in 2023. Uh, we already shared some preliminary, uh, I would say, early positive signals last year. And we are planning to do uh, an update again uh, in the second half of 2022. And then, like I said, hopefully concluding the trial and uh, getting back to the patients and to the investigators with some uh, final results somewhere in 2023. Um, I think all information, uh, further information about the trial, of course, can be found on uh, the Innate Pharma website. And I know there is a certain links also, I think, on, on your website at, at the CLF, Susan. Yes. So with that, I, I, I stop here. Um, I'm happy, of course, to, 
to answer any questions later on. Great, thank you, Stephen. And um, I think it's really exciting to see how, what we've got in the clinical trial pipeline from early phase one through phase two and phase three and um, really appreciate all the hard work that you're doing and for on behalf of patients. And as you said, uh, unmet need, we still have a lot of work to do in helping find targeted therapies. And for anyone that joined us for Dr. Choi's discussion on the research landscape, you may have an idea of how all these things are fitting in and how important it is to have that very early discovery of potential molecules and certain things and then moving through clinical trial. And then, and then what do we do after that? And we'll talk a little bit about that a little later. So um, next up on our agenda will be our friends from Sologenics. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Christopher Poulian, who is joining us as their medical director. Um, they have an interesting clinical trial that has just finished up. I'll let let Chris talk a little bit about their high bright um, light therapy, which I think is something very, very different and looking at um, early stage patients. So Chris, welcome. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi, thanks, Susan. I appreciate the opportunity to get here and talk to all of you today. Um, <clears throat> I know most of the people listening are in the patient community, obviously. So I wanna to try to keep this talk focused on that. Um, I'll start with the, the good news. We had a positive phase three clinical study. So that's what everybody here uh, on the research side uh, wants to get to. And we have uh, achieved that milestone, which we're very, very happy uh, about. Um, and maybe in case you weren't able to, to be at Dr. Choi's lecture, I could give just a quick cliff note version to kind of put that in perspective for you. You heard a lot of buzzwords today about uh, phases of clinical research. Basically phase one is primarily safety. Uh, you're giving it to, you're giving an experimental treatment to uh, healthy volunteers and making sure that there's no safety concerns. Uh, if that's successful and you move forward into phase two, you're then going to get into a situation where you're trying to um, maybe tweak your dose a little bit, hone in on what your patient population actually is, and then get a sense of what you think uh, the most appropriate disease indication is. And then finally, if all that works out, you get to a phase three clinical trial, which is kind of where we just finished, where you, you blow it up. It's, it's big, big patient numbers, typically, uh, a very specific patient population. In our case, it was early stage CTCL, so 1A, 1B, um, 2A patients. Um, and you basically try to just go full out and prove that this uh, therapy is effective. What we have in, in Highbright uh, is, like Susan said, a, a pretty unique um, situation where it's a topical ointment that you apply to uh, the areas of disease on your skin and only the areas of disease on your skin. Um, and then after a period of time, you stand in front of a fluorescent light or a visible light. In our clinical trial it was a fluorescent light, but um, it doesn't have to be limited to fluorescent. It could be any light source that emits a visible light. And I emphasize visible light because it's a contrast with ultraviolet light. Um, many of you that are, are patients and have been patients for a while will understand that there is some safety concerns and some safety risks with overexposure to ultraviolet light therapy. So one of the, the really unique aspects of, of our uh, therapy that we explored in this clinical trial was that it was visible light and it didn't have those uh, safety side effects of, of overexposure to, to ultraviolet light that they could bring. Um, basically at a high level, the way the trial worked was we gave everybody um, in the, in, it was broken up into cycles. And the difference between the cycles was basically what you were treated and with what. In the first cycle, um, you had the option of either, it was, again, it was a, like we talked about before, a blinded study. So the doctors and the patients didn't know uh, what, what uh, the treatment assignment that each patient was getting. And they were either getting drug or they were getting placebo. Uh, they treated that for a period of time. It was, it was eight weeks. And, and then they would do an evaluation to baseline and see how the patients did. That was our primary endpoint. And, and again, it proved to be uh, statistically significant in reducing the patient's uh, burden of disease. And the way we measured that burden of disease uh, was uh, very specific called the Kale score. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it, but it's a way to quantify uh, lesion response. It takes into a, um, 
it takes into consideration all the different characteristics of your disease. So the scaling, the, uh, the raised plaque nature, um, and the erythema. Um, then after cycle one was over, uh, we looked at uh, cycle two, where everybody got the opportunity to be uh, on the on the uh, active therapy. So it was more an open label type design. Um, and again, it was the same same treatment duration. It was eight weeks long. Um, and then we had an evaluation after that. And then finally, uh, if they chose, we had an open label uh, study, uh, a compassionate use arm of the study, where again, the patients were going to treat with active drug for the same duration that they had done in cycle one and cycle two. But in this instance, they were treating any and all desired lesions on their body that they wanted. So a much more real world type um, treatment for the patients. Um, I, I view it as a positive personally, in my opinion, that the majority of the patients that participated in the clinical trial opted to participate in this optional phase three study. Those of you that have been on clinical research, you know that it's not, um, it, it's uh, following study protocol is not always the easiest thing to do. And so it is really a commitment on the patient's part and the physician's part to continue enrolling. And so the fact that the, the patients chose to opt into this uh, compassionate use, like again, the majority of patients choosing to do so, I think really highlights what they perceived as a, a benefit for themselves. Um, and, and also the physicians thought that it was worthwhile their patients continuing in the therapy. Um, the end result of this is that we, we saw an increased response um, uh, of the targeted areas that were, that were treated. Um, again, it was statistically significant. I think some high levels to take away from what we saw uh, in the clinical study was that, first off, this was the largest double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled study that's ever been done in CTCL. So um, chances are, if you go back and talk to your treating physician, if you go to one of the larger uh, medical sites here, they're going to know um, what the FLASH study was. They're going to be familiar with Hybride, and many of the physicians that you hear from today um, and that uh, are involved with the CLF were principal investigators on the clinical trial. Um, it was run by um, the University of Pennsylvania as our lead PI, Dr. Ellen Kim there. And again, uh, this is something that really couldn't have been possible without the participation of the, the larger medical community. A couple other key takeaways that we saw from, from the clinical trial was that it was effective in both uh, patch and plaque type disease. So that's something that's uh, oftentimes unique to a topical therapy. They might be targeted uh, towards one or other. Um, and uh, we didn't really see that. One of the advantages that the fluorescent light and visible light has is that it can penetrate deeper into the, to the skin tissue than ultraviolet light. Um, so it's able to get uh, through um, thicker layers of your skin, so to speak. Um, and we believe that may be one of the reasons why we saw the, uh, the effect that we saw. And of course, that's very positive um, to hear for for patients. Um, and finally, I'll just tell you where we're going now, um, what we're doing. So once you conclude a phase three clinical research study, then you've got to take all this data that I kind of just uh, tried to give you a five minute snippet of, and you put it into a uh, comprehensive digestible package uh, for the FDA. Um, it has a lot to do with the, the clinical research results. It has a lot to do with uh, drug manufacture and other types of regulatory processes. Um, and like has been mentioned before, we do have fast track uh, designation for this. Um, we also are hoping to have our uh, priority review timelines. We will be uh, submitting, we plan to submit our, our new drug application to the FDA uh, before the end of this year, um, which hopefully means that soon uh, you all will have uh, an, another therapy that's an option to you. Um, I know uh, that one of the challenges that we have right now in this treatment landscape is that we don't really have anything that is approved for first line treatment of early stage CTCL. Um, things that are prescribed to you typically right now are either uh, off label, um, meaning that they're really approved for another indication and your physicians are giving it to you uh, for the treatment of CTCL, or they're approved for CTCL, but there's some caveats. They've, they've got to have failed prior therapies or or something of the like. So our goal at the end of this is to provide a therapy that is safe and effective uh, for early stage patients and that is available to you pretty much right out of the gate. Um, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to talk uh, with anyone. My contact num uh, information is available uh, on the website. And uh, with that, I'll yield back to uh, Susan. Great. Thank you, Chris, and we'll be keeping tabs on um, your process as well and looking forward to hopefully having a new therapy available 
next year, which would, is pretty exciting, especially for early stage patients. And um, if, you know, we've been um, following the FLASH trial for quite a few years, and you can see a little bit of the history going back many years ago, I think, um, when we talked about when you were in phase two, I think you had just gone into the phase two clinical trials. So, you know, we're, we are, as the foundation, trying to capture kind of all the different phases of clinical trials as they're happening and providing updates so that you can be educated on what's happening in the research landscape. And we're doing our best to stay connected um, to everything. We, we don't have all the clinical trials, but we're doing our best. So you can find some good information on our website as well, and hopefully have it be in, in layperson's terminology and in small chunks. So thank you, Chris. And we'll be keeping tabs on, uh, on how things go for the rest of the year. And we're going to switch gears a little bit now and move over to our friends who have uh, therapies that are commercially available. And one of our newer therapies that was approved back in 2018 is Movimeluzumab. And we have Rob Rastuccia, who's the Director of Medical Affairs and Oncology from Kiowa Kirin with us today to share with us what's happening in the land of Movimeluzumab and um, talk a little bit about uh, the company and what you're doing in our space of cutaneous lymphomas. And I think what's very exciting is, is um, we now heard from several companies that are in clinical trial, which is a very structured, right, approach to bringing new therapies to market. And now we have therapies that are available. And once therapies like mogamaluzumab are available across the board, more data is collected, more things are learned. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob to talk a little bit about what's happening in the landscape of mogamaluzumab. All right. Thanks very much, Susan. And thank you for inviting me to this event. Uh, so let me introduce you first to Kiwa Kieran. Uh, we are a specialty ph pharmaceutical company where our goal is to work together to understand uh, the clinical needs and opportunities for innovation that can help patients, uh, help advance the care of patients. And in this case, we're, we're really focused on those patients with mycosis, fungoides, and sesame syndrome. Uh, since 2018, uh, the North American organization has received approval from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for three first-in-class medicines, uh, which are achievements that we share with both the scientific community as well as the medical community and, of course, the advocacy communities who all contributed greatly to the success of these programs. Uh, Potolegio, or Mogamulizumab, as it's also known, was developed to block a receptor called CCR4, that is expressed on the surface of a type of white blood cell known as a lymphocyte. And it's also thought to play a role in mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome. So the drug was investigated through clinical studies, including the phase three Maverick study, which showed that patients who were treated with Potolegio had better outcomes, uh, both progression-free survival and overall response, relative to those who were treated with a different drug for, that is uh, used for patients with mycosis fungoides or Cesare syndrome. Um, of course, all medicines do come with risks, and so it's important that you understand uh, what they are before starting any treatment. And with Potolegio, uh, the most common adverse events we saw in clinical trials were rash, tiredness, diarrhea, muscle uh, and bone pain, and as well as upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, Potolegio may also cause some serious side effects that can be severe or life-threatening, including skin problems, infusion reactions, infections, autoimmune problems, and complications from stem cell transplant. Um, that said, the findings from the Maverick study were uh, sufficient to secure FDA approval for Potolegio in 2018, uh, and it is now approved to treat uh, patients with mycosis fungoides or Cesare syndrome who are adults who have tried at least one prior medicine, which could be taken by mouth or by injection, for whom that medicine either did not work or the disease has come back. Uh, however, we didn't stop the research with the conclusion of the Maverick study uh, and the approval of Protolegio. And so we're still continuing to work to develop the, the, the drug and to bring further advancement to patients. And one of those advancements came from a, a deep dive that we did on some of the data from the Maverick study, where we looked more closely at the characteristics of the patients who were those who responded best to the drug. And we found some characteristics that helped uh, clarify who might respond best. Uh, in this case, it, we, we actually found uh, that the patients who had cancerous cells present in their blood were the ones who responded, uh, who, who generally tended to respond the best to, to the drug. 
Looking ahead, um, our research will continue. And right now we're focused on several different um, areas for patients with mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome. Uh, first of all, we're looking at how Hodelegio can impact the quality of life for these patients as well as for their caregivers. Um, we're also looking at the feasibility of alternative dosing schedules for Hodelegio that may allow patients to have fewer trips to the infusion center. And uh, of course, we're also looking into uh, the development of rash with Hodelegio and how that may be related to uh, the way patients respond to the drug on treatment. And so with that, I just would like to thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today and to demonstrate Q. Akiran's commitment to patients with mycosis fungoides or Cesar syndrome. And so I'll turn it back to you, Susan. Great. Thank you, Rob. That was really great. And I, I think it really speaks to the importance that, you know, I think we're all excited, of course, of what's in the clinical trial pipeline and how things are coming to be made available for the general patient population. But it's so important as well once things get through the pipeline and are approved, what happens next, right? And what do we learn? And, and continuing to understand the impact in a real world environment on patients. And it also gives us the opportunity, again, I go back to uh, Dr. Choi's presentation and looking at how do we combine some of these therapies as we learn more and more about the disease itself and the disease biology, we can really use these new therapeutic in different ways that maybe were not actually um, part of the clinical trial. So thank you so much for sharing with us what's happening in the world of um, mogamaluzumab and for continuing to capture data and share that with the clinical environment and with the patients. Um, I think it's, it's just so, so wonderful and important to stay tuned and stay connected. So really appreciate you taking the time with us today. So uh, I'm gonna move on in my alphabetic soup here to our friends from Mallinckrodt and invite Kathy Jackson uh, to join us, who's our director, the director of patient engagement and advocacy. And many of you may be more familiar with the actual uh, therapeutic uh, extracorporeal photophoresis or ECP or the Theracos brand name. Um, you know, we as the foundation have been engaged with the folks from who've been delivering this therapy for a long time. And it's been a mainstay uh, in treatment for cutaneous lymphomas for many, many, many years. And it's really delightful, Kathy, to have you join us. Um, and I'll let turn it over to you to talk a little bit about what, uh, what you're up to at Mallinckrodt and with ECP and, and um, what you'd like to share with our patient community, many of whom I think are familiar with this therapy and some uh, who may not be. So over to you. You're on mute. Kathy, you're on mute. <laughs> I thought I had unmuted. Thank you, Susan, for such a lovely introduction and uh, a special thank you to everyone and for this opportunity to speak to you all today. So we're proud to support this conference. I've, as Susan said, I've had the privilege uh, and uh, pleasure of working with Susan and the CLF team for many years. And I can say they run an exceptional organization and so that the CTCL community is really in good hands. So Mallinckrodt is a 150 year old company founded on the banks of the Mississippi uh, in St. Louis. Um, the focus, our focus is autoimmune and rare diseases. And we have a treatment in a number of areas, including one for the skin symptoms of CTCL, extracorporeal photophoresis, commonly known as ECP. And so um, I'm not going to speak much on that today, but I will please uh, I encourage you to visit our exhibit. Uh, our exhibit, you're going to find out a lot about the therapy. You're going to find out about our ambassador program for patient, people who want to share their experiences with ECP and also find out about our brand new Facebook page. Um, we're so excited that uh, we are moving ahead with our social media, and so please visit our, our Facebook page. Um, you'll also have an opportunity when you're on that site to connect to uh, the company, to a representative of the company uh, through email, and we can uh, you can ask questions, and we're always looking uh, for feedback on the processes with ECP and your experiences so that we can continue to work to improve that. So please feel free to connect with us, and so um, I uh, 
want to just say on behalf of, of all of Mallinckrodt, uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, please know that the patients that we serve, your, yourselves and your care partners, inspire us every day to do what we do. We are um, just um, very grateful for any opportunity we have to connect with you. And we just uh, uh, appreciate um, all that you're going through. And, and so when you share your experiences with us, it really helps us because uh, you are the reason we exist. And so I wanna say, um, have a great rest of the meeting. And I really am hoping that next year we get to meet in person. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Kathy. And, um, you know, I, I will say this brings up another really good point, again, to reiterate that the all of the companies and the people behind the companies that are serving us in the patient community with their therapies really do want to hear from you and about your experiences, because that really helps them to develop in a better way, you know, uh, how how to present the therapy, how, how the clinicians can present the therapy, make your experience with the therapy better. And if, if they don't hear from you, they don't know. So again, um, to follow up on Kathy's uh, invitation, and I know it's open for all of the companies, you know, reach out and let them know what your experience is um, all across the board, right? Uh, because they really want to understand so that they can perhaps do things differently and it can help inform your experience in the future or other people's experience with the treatment. So thanks for joining us today, Kathy, and we really um, appreciate your support over all of, all of these years and look forward to uh, more years ahead. So our final discussion today is our friends from Orthodermatologics and we have Michael Nagoza from who's the National Director of Professional Strategy and their therapy is Bexeratine, both capsules and gel and I again one of our long mainstay therapies in cutaneous lymphomas it's a cornerstone of many of us who have uh, been grappling with cutaneous lymphomas. I know myself, I've had experiences with bexeratine and you know it, it fits into the treatment protocols and has for a long, long time. Um, and I, I won't, uh, I should probably say Michael Young, who's on the, on the call with me um, was actually back in the day when the therapy was introduced back in the late 90s was instrumental in bringing this to market for cutaneous lymphoma. But, you know, it's a, again, a mainstay in our space. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael to share a little bit about um, what orthodermatologics is up to and, and how Bexerotene fits into um, their portfolio. So Michael, over to you. Thanks, Susan. Can you all hear me okay? Fantastic. Yes, we can. All right, good. Uh, Susan, if you weren't going to say it, I was going to mention that Michael had a role in that as well. So I appreciate you uh, stealing the thunder in advance. Um, I'd like to definitely thank the CLF. Um, you know, I caught part of yesterday's session. And for those of you that were on, I know we have, uh, I think, about 30 uh, uh, or more patients in, in the audience with us. Um, if you were keeping track, the word family was used countless times, uh, both by Susan and the board, Michael, um, Joyce and telling her story. And I think it's so incredibly important. I'm newer to the uh, CLF uh, community and, and certainly in my journey that began probably about a year and a half ago when I took over the franchise was unique. I had heard all these names, Susan Thornton, Michael Young, um, you hear Dr. Dubik, you hear all the, the uh, names that are out there, Dr. Kim that you've heard a couple of times today, Dr. Zick. And what's interesting is that my very first um, meeting, which just took place earlier this year, I had called my team. They were setting up the booth at the exhibit, and they said, well, you'll never guess who we're chatting with right now. We're chatting with Susan. We're chatting with Michael. We're chatting with the doctors. And I think that's important for you to know as a patient, because when you hear the word family, a lot of times it's just it's mentioned, it's thrown out there. But I think the folks at the CLF really do walk the walk and, and, and walk the talk that they have. And uh, the listening to the industry partners that we have here too, it's a very unique group. And I think everyone does have a vested interest in making sure that your journey uh, is as uh, successful and, and, and um, uh, uneventful as possible. 
So as it relates to myself, I've been with Orthodermatologics for the last five years. And if you're not familiar with the company Orthoderm, uh, it's a, a dermatology company that's been in existence for quite a long time. It's a, a deep, rich history with dermatology products. Many of those you probably recognize from a name brand standpoint, Retin-A is one of them. We have almost 35 different dermatology products. Um, and, and the one that fits into the CLF uh, that's used here is obviously called Bexeritine or uh, the brand name is Targretin Gel or Targretin Caps. Um, as it relates to Orthoderm as an organization, we're a family focused or, uh, organization. It's one of the reasons why I joined the company. So that's why I thought the family uh, mentioned was so incredibly relevant. We have a desire to give back to the community. And you, Susan was talking before about feedback from patients to us uh, to help improve our process, help improve access, help improve products, so incredibly important. So please don't take that lightly. We all have uh, um, an opportunity for you to connect with us in the, the exhibit, and we, we encourage you to take advantage of that. But as it relates to a, a couple of other things that might be relevant for you as it um, uh, pertains to orthoderm, you know, we have a lot of uh, products that have been long standing um, in, in dermatology, but we're constantly looking for ways to innovate. And I'll give you a good example of that. Uh, steroids are very, very common um, and, and they're out there. And a couple of years ago, we have a uh, partnership with Dow uh, Pharmaceuticals and Dow manufactures our formulations. Um, through the partnership with them, they had an opportunity to tweak a typically used uh, a very common uh, steroid and through the formulation, the FDA has granted us, we have an indication for psoriasis for a, a product called Brihotly. And, and the interesting thing about that is it can be used once a day and up to eight weeks. So we're looking to innovate and change how products are made and change how, most importantly, patients can use those products. Um, but the, you know, it really doesn't matter unless the patients can have access to those products. So I do encourage you to, to go to the exhibit and take a look at the access programs that we have there for you. We have a variety of different ways for you to, um, to obtain uh, the products that we have. And then also, you know, uh, our team uh, is able to provide in some institutions samples of products that you would commonly use during your therapy. CeraVe, we have a partnership with L'Oreal. We're able to get that to you too. So again, knowledge is power. And I think it's incredibly important that you take advantage of that, take advantage of the companies that are at your disposal, knowing that we truly do want to help. And, and, uh, and help you on your journey, as Joyce mentioned yesterday, it truly is a partnership. So all that being said, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I look forward to hopefully hearing from some of you. And most importantly, I look forward to the continued relationship that we have with the CLF group. Susan, thank you. Great, thank you, Michael. And I, I think, um, wow, that's like perfect timing, everybody. Y'all were so wonderful to uh, fit into the hour timeline. This is great. I. I truly hope that this kind of quick introduction to the companies, the people behind the companies, the therapeutics, looking at, you know, from early stage phase one, all the way through therapies that have been available for a long time in our space, um, gives you a sense of really, truly the dedication and compassion and commitment that is behind the scenes um, with the industry and trying to bring products to market, keep products on the market that we, we use and to collectively um, help all of us that are living with, with this, this disease. Um, Michael, you know, you've been in the biopharma industry for um, your career. I, I don't, and you certainly have a lot of insights into the cutaneous lymphoma world and as it pertains to therapeutics and development, anything you'd like to add before we sign off here in the next couple of minutes? Yeah, I just wanted to, number one, certainly thank all of um, those who have uh, joined us today. Um, but what's more important than that, uh, when you look at that screen and you look at the companies that are actually supporting the foundation, they are doing so not only with um, precious dollars that they are contributing to keeping uh, the foundation and its goals uh, front and center, but the other thing is that um, I would like uh, the patients to understand that you know that this is an orphan disease. You know that this is a rare disease. And for that reason, what's so special about these companies is that they've chosen a field which, you know, really 
isn't a major money maker. It's not a huge profit center for any of these companies. And the fact that they are devoting both research time and commercial time um, to make sure that uh, these products are um, accessible as well as affordable for all of you um, is just a major feather in their cap. And uh, I couldn't be prouder to be associated with, uh, with all of these folks that are on the screen with you here. Um, it's a wonderful, uh, as uh, Michael uh, brought up earlier, it's a wonderful family. And we're very, very glad to all be brothers and sisters in this. So thanks everybody for being here today. And uh, Susan, again, uh, great experiment. I think this went very, very well. So I hope everybody else uh, enjoyed it as well. And uh, we may try uh, an expanded version of this so a little bit later this year. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, everybody, for joining us and taking time out and sharing a little snippet um, of yourselves with us today. And we look forward to more conversations and more engagement with all of you as we, as we move along. And I hope everybody enjoyed the session. We'll definitely please put your feedback in the evaluation forum and what we could do better, differently. Um, and if this, if you liked it, what do you, what would you like to see more of how we can follow up because, you know, we're really here to serve you. So, um, let us know. And I think we're going to a lunch break if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, enjoy your lunch break and we'll see you back here. We've got networking and Q and A and some more presentations. So, um, we'll see you back in a little bit, everybody. Thanks so much. And thanks to all of our folks. Steven, who us. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Chris, thanks very much. Robert, Scott, yeah. and Michael, right. thank, thank you so much. Really appreciate Abiento. you taking Salut. time out. <laughs> Salud. Of course. All right. Bye now. Yeah. Thank Goodbye. you. Enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks so much.